if today is the product, some of you kind of know what to expect, and some of you have no idea, right? <laughs> So right off the bat, two different customer cohorts, right? You've got the ones who were uh, kind of like know what to expect and can, uh, I don't know, baseline the, the, what they've had in the past to this one. And then you've got those that are just wide open and, and have no idea what, what's coming up, right? So I came and interned with Amazon Music. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But um, and, and, and a product manager internship is very much the way I, I, I kind of like received it is a sentence. We need to X because of Y. That's it. Go like figure it out three months. Uh, so I did that, uh, got my uh, full time offer, went back to school and then came back to to Seattle for full time. Today I work for Amazon devices, been there for almost two years. So Amazon devices, uh, Amazon devices is basically all the physical devices that Amazon makes. So Echo, Kindle, uh, tablets, uh, Echo Buds, whatever, microwaves. Um, I specifically work on Kindle. So let's start to kind of like break you guys apart. Um, Waze, Google Maps. Who uses Waze? Who uses Google Maps? Why do you use Waze and not Google Maps? For cops. Yeah. For cops? All right, so that's something you care about, cops. Um, what else? What's that? So, so it's better on Waze for you? Do you guys have any, uh, so they're both owned by Google, right? Um, Google bought Waze, uh, used to be an Israeli company, still, still in, is in Israel. Um, what's the difference between these two? Like, they're both by Google, they both tell you how to get from point A to B, some of them have more features like, you know, uh, cops, road conditions, maybe some of them update faster. Is there anything inherently different from getting to point A, from point A to point B in your eyes? No? Well, there is, so any idea? All right, so this is from a, this is from a product manager that built Waze, and so Waze uh, really will get you from point A to point B the fastest way possible, right? So that means take a right, take a U-turn, go on this dirt road, if, you, if you've ticked off like yes for dirt roads, um, and, um, and just get you there as fast as possible. Maps will get you there fast, but will probably not take those same routes that Waze did if, if the roads are perfectly fine, then they'll both probably take the same one. But the idea is that maps is for people who want a worry-free ride, right? I want to get from point A to point B, not too many turns. I just want to ride, listen to my podcast. That's it. Waze is for those who, if they've learned that there was a way to get from point A to B two minutes faster, they would be furious, right? So two different products both owned by Google, two different customers. Sometimes you don't even know why you're a customer of one or the other, but some of you did make a decision to choose Waze versus the other because of certain features. <coughs> Who leaves voicemail messages? Who doesn't? Interesting, right? It's a product that like all of us encounter but choose not to, two different customers. Who eats the apple sliced and who eats it whole? I eat it whole. Sliced. Same product, different customers. Who sets their alarm clock uh, with just one? And who has like N amount of? <laughs> of I got one. You got one? Who's got the N? Like, what are we talking about? Like 10? Five? Who knows? Who's your voice? Ah, I see. I have 40, I might have two. <laughs> nice. So this one is not really a product feature, but you guys are, like, one customer cohort is using it or hacked it in a way that's going to serve them better. Just wake up on the first one. It's like Airbnb or hotels? Both, right? Both. Is there anyone that's, like, strict? 
I used to be very strict for Airbnb. For Airbnb. When, it, when they came out, I was like, that's it. I'm only going for Airbnb. I think when I moved to the US, uh, I realized hotels could be better. And then like I'm mixing, but that's also because now I have kids and my wife doesn't like Airbnb so much. I think if, it's, if it was just me, Airbnb all the way. Who pays to listen to music? Who doesn't? Do you still listen to music? Just not pay for it or not listen to music at all? Who's using like a free service? Like, nice. All right, we'll talk about that. All right, my favorite one. Who owns a Kindle? Who does not own a Kindle? For those who own a Kindle, do you want to refine that? Do you want to, like, what's, is there something missing in the explanation of what is an e-reader, what is a Kindle? What's different in the screen versus your phone? It looks like print, why? So, so there's something different in the technology, right? So an e-reader is, basically has an e-ink screen, right? So this is physical ink that goes to the top of the screen that's why when you shut it off, the image is still there. But the idea is that the experience of reading on an e-reader versus reading on your phone is significantly different because of the technology that goes into an e-reader. By the way, technology has not changed in the last 14 years. On it, like, improved, it hasn't changed material. So my role for Kindle, apart from some other stuff, but my role, I have two customer cohorts. I've got the prior owners, those who already own a Kindle, and I need to sell, sell them a new one, an upgraded one. And then I've got the uh, customer acquisition bucket. So these are customers who have never owned an e-reader, right? It's tricky. We're selling the same device for a customer that might know what it is, knows the value proposition, can say, oh, this is e-ink. And we're also selling the same device to a customer who's like, ah, this is like my phone, but it's not, right? So this is how I like to start thinking about customers as they relate to problems that we're trying to solve. One, what are these different customer cohorts? And two, what do they know about my product? What do they need to know about my product? How is it different from each other? I'm going to walk you guys today through um, really, really high level uh, ideas of how to unpack a problem, so to speak. So usually it's a problem statement. So when I came to, and, and this is what you will encounter, I think, for, for any product manager that will come into the, the job on day one or will start 2020 with a fresh, like, like what are we going to do next year? Um, a lot of times it starts with a sentence. So when I joined uh, music, they said, we've got Prime Music. So these are Prime customers who can listen to Amazon uh, Prime Music, which was free if you're a Prime member and had like 2 million songs. And then we've got Amazon Music Unlimited, which is basically like your Spotify premium, right? We need to get customers from this cohort to migrate to this cohort, from free to paid from zero to $10 a month. That's it. Like, go figure it out. Um, and so I wanna, throughout, like today, when we talk about different things, talk about three different companies and potentially what would be uh, three different problem statements for each. We're gonna talk about Kindle, so that's the one I'm doing right now, so I'll have more insights for you about that. And then we'll talk about Spotify and we'll talk about Airbnb, which, I've never worked at, so I don't know if I'm right. So let's all share together our, our ideas on how to unpack these problems. I don't really think this is a framework. Like, I don't see this as a framework, uh, like the different slides that we'll go through. They're not mandatory to unpack a problem, but this is how I like to think about things at high level. Like, I've got a problem, I'm gonna take a shower now, and I'm gonna think about all these different things, and once I've kind of conceptualized what I'm up against, then I'm gonna solve it. 
All right, so problem statement. So we've got Kindle. So the first problem we gotta solve is we gotta upgrade existing device owners. Spotify. This is similar to what I've done with uh, Amazon Music. So we got upsell premier tier to current free customers. And then we got Airbnb. Uh, we got upsell experiences. So experiences on Airbnb, for those who don't know, so you book a room, uh, now what they have, you can actually just go to airbnb.com. Like experiences are front, front and center, right? They're trying to sell you, uh, I don't know, you, you're in Madrid, like a guide, like you've got your, you booked your house, now here's a guide to tour the market, whatever, right? All these different experiences. So this is what we're gonna be up against. The first question I think that you'll hear in all the PM books and everything, in all the PM interviews, is be ready to ask why. Okay? Because when I joined music, they told me we got to upsell premium to current free customers by taking the data, the metadata of the songs, seeing how customers interact with that metadata, and predict when will someone upgrade to Amazon Music Unlimited. All right, that's pretty specific. So you go ahead and you start to solve that and you gather all the data and you start to you know, do some regressions, but how about asking why? Like, why do we want them to do this? Because maybe the solution does not even like, follow in the data itself. Maybe it's not about predicting. Maybe it's something completely different. Maybe it's marketing-based, right? Maybe it's, what, maybe it's just like discount-based. Maybe it's expansion based. Who knows? So that's why we're asking, why are we doing this? And when we ask, why are we doing this? There is the why for the customer. That's external. Like, what would the customer benefit if I were to do this and that? That really ties to marketing. Um, or it really ties to incremental product features that we'll make. And then you got the internal. It's like, how would we internally benefit from customers moving from point A to B, and that's not always very clear. A lot of times this is your finance folks, right? They're like, we gotta save the business in some way. Maybe we should do X or Y or Z. You gotta know that they're in on it, right? Because maybe it involves investments first. So let me ask you, why should we upgrade existing device owners on Kindle? Well, actual device. So, so one, you're right, right? So Kindle makes it, its money because you buy Kindle, then you buy books. So you've got your device, it's working. Why, and you're gonna make money off of books, why should I get you the better one? All of that, so that's good, right? So straight up revenue, right? <coughs> but maybe you sell a device at a loss. So maybe, you, maybe the profit aspect goes down. You said something about customer experience. Unpack that a little bit. Potentially, a new device has better experiences. Why? Because all of a sudden, now there is light on the device. Or there is additional, more better uniform light. So maybe they can read better at night. So maybe they're going to read more at night. So maybe they're going to buy more books at night. Right? Or not at night, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah. So they would do it if you've got, yeah, they, they, they would do it. So that's one thing. So like, all right, like another incremental feature that you may not have in the older ones. Okay. So if a customer keeps on purchasing, they've bought into the idea, they made an initial investment, that's one way to retain them. And that's true. So customers who actually upgrade end up sticking around for longer, right? And then why do we upsell on Airbnb? We'll skip the Spotify one. Why do we upsell for Airbnb? Like, what's in it for them? Why would they want to do this? This is a very different product than what they built their platform on. So improving customer experience once you're already traveling. Okay. What about internal? Internal incentives to do this. Okay. So there's revenue. There's um, diversification, right? So basically, if tomorrow... Like, I don't know, they're like the, you, like in New York, right? So in New York, you can no longer uh, book Airbnbs for no, if, if it's less than 30 days, I think. So all of a sudden, like, what, what, what if it happens in Europe? 
Like EU is sa says no more Airbnb in Europe. So you got to start diversifying. So that's one, these are kind of different ways of, of thinking through external uh, and internal jobs because this will help you uh, actually understand which cohorts you need to, you need to kind of go after, right? So experiences versus cu customers who are actually going to uh, book a place could be very different. So let's assume this is kind of like a small, um, a, a small example that you guys uh, will unpack. So Amazon retail, all right? If you had to break down Amazon retail customers, so basically whoever goes online and shops on Amazon, how would you break down the customers to only two cohorts? Like you're either in this bucket or you're in this bucket in a way that would make sense for Amazon. We gotta make sure um, that we measure the right things. So we've got our problem. We've got, go back to the Kindle, Spotify, and the, uh, and the Airbnb uh, aspect. What are the ways, what are the, I would call it columns or buckets that we care about that you would start measuring, or do you, would you forecast um, that that would make sense? So I'll start with one, because you guys mentioned it, sales, right? I wanna increase Kindle upgrades. One of the ways I'm gonna measure this is, are the actions that I'm taking increasing sales? Like that's, it's always like, we're in here, like this is corporate, right? Like money needs to come in. Sales are, are always there, right? Is there any other bucket that makes a lot of sense that may not see initial revenue right away? Engagement is crucial, right? How would you measure um, if, if something that you're doing is working when there isn't an initial revenue coming in? Is that customer using my product more, right? Are they listening to more songs per day? Are they skipping less songs per hour, whatever? right, engagement. Um, I put some more up. So we've got the sales on all of them. Engagement, we can talk about engagement on all of them. What about efficiencies? This is more kind of internal. So what if my cost structure for Spotify, when I've got free customers, is higher than if those customers would be um, would be uh, premium. I'm talking about cost, I'm not talking about the revenue. Meaning I gotta pay for a free customer $1, and if they're premium, I gotta pay for them, I don't know, 0.5, right? Those are real instances where you would wanna move a customer from one cohort to the other simply for internal efficiencies. This very much goes into operations, right? Like, what if, um, a customer who's non-prime and you've set up all your systems to like ship the item in a day or two in a specific FC fulfillment center and now you've got a lot of customers who are non-prime and they're you know we can't like put them in the in the quick kind of operation mode of ship it a day or two uh, and we got to wait for five to six days even if we might even if it might cost us more to ship in six to seven days versus shipping one or two days, right? Like, imagine tomorrow there are no more prime customers, right? I'm just making this up, but everything is like to the extreme. So let me use an extreme example. There are no more customers. They all became non-prime and they all make an order tomorrow. The FCs are just sitting there. They're like, all right, let's wait for day six, seven. We can't ship it now because it's a prime benefit. Right? So a lot of times, and I, I exa like this is a, a very exaggerated example, but a lot of times efficiencies internally would, um, would tie back to the problem in, in, in something that you will measure. If you've got customer service calls, if customer service calls go down because of a change you've made in your product, pretty good, right? If none of that happens, but over time you're building a brand that's more likable, also good, also an important bucket. So all these buckets, when you come up with a solution, they usually all tie to potentially a different group in your organization, right? So you got the finance people, you got the sales people, you got the marketing people. If you rally them on your product or on your incremental feature, and you know exactly how to measure it, right? They're in on it. Because if no one, if your product has immense 
efficiencies on the cost side, but you haven't told anyone that that's what you predict will happen, you may not get enough funding. But if you realize that there's going to be efficiencies, you can say, hey, like operation folks, why don't you put in a million bucks? Help me, because it's going to save you two million down the road, right? So it's all about finding stakeholders that would help you, um, that would help you kind of get behind you to rally the product. All right. So I chose these as the examples. I specifically said we're going to focus for Kindle. We're going to focus on for upgrading customers. We're going to focus on the product. For Spotify, we're going to focus on marketing to upgrade them from the free to premium. And then for uh, incentives, we're going to focus on Airbnb, right? So we want to, uh, for Airbnb, we want to diversify and sell more uh, experiences. So on the product side, what is it? It's basically hardware product features, right? Or it could be incremental software features. So essentially, really, like after we've created the strategy, what are we actually going to implement, right? So if we've learned that a lot of our customers right now are saying, like, guys, like, you got to have USB-C on your Kindles. It's just not, like, all my phones have USB-C. You guys have micro USB. It just doesn't work anymore. We're going to make a hardware feature. Or it could be anything else, right? So that, that would be one. What can you do on the marketing end for Spotify to get from from free to premium. So that, that ties a little bit to incentives, right? It's like, I'm going to make you do something, and I'm going to give you something in return. So that ties, I see that, so it's a combination of marketing and incentive. But marketing is straight up, we're not making any changes to the product. Like, we're not adding light. We're not adding software features. We just want to tell you what's out there, right? Incentives for Airbnb, what are you going to do? Like, how are you going to get them to use more experiences? Again, no changes in the product. So for a customer who has booked a room, uh, they finished booking, we know they're going to Madrid, here's, I don't know, $10 off for choose your own, your own experience or whatever. So that's an incentive. So everything we've talked about is down here. The next thing I want to talk to you guys about is exactly the point that you made. Two million versus 10 million. Whenever you decide on what are we going to do, there's always a downside. Like, right, like, you're going to upgrade people that are going to be like, oh, I can't believe there's 10 million and I only got two. But what about the others, right? So we always want to think about the actions that we take as product managers. How do they affect are non-customers, right? So at the beginning, we broke it down. We broke Kindle down for like prior owners versus non-prior owners. If I'm focusing on features that are really much like hardcore focused on the prior owners and want to get them to upgrade, and I physically change something in the device, is there a chance I'm actually hurting customer acquisition, right? Like. If I'm going to have incremental product features and it's going to increase the price of the device by 30 bucks, and now I've priced out those who have no idea what this device is and they're never going to try it at $100. They would have tried it at 70, but now they're not going to try it. Who are these customers? We got to map them out, right? Because when you think about all these incremental features that you're gonna, going to implement, you're always going to have people within the organization that are going to be like, whoa, this is really bad for my customers. Like, it's cool. Like, you work for Spotify, and you want to upgrade them to the premium. You're in the premium, uh, you know, the premium tier group. But what about us? We're, we're here to increase the engagement and the customer satisfaction for the free. And you're going to tell the free that they're going to, like, that their two million sucks, right? It's really, really, you got to keep, as a product manager, you got to keep a wide lens on who are you hurting and which customers are you actually benefiting? And which customers are you actually hurting? And to, in my experience, there's always a balance there. Like, just don't forget about the customers that are not yours within the organization. Because as you saw at the beginning, some of you slice apples. Some of you don't. Some of you use Waze. Some of you use Maps for really good reasons, right? If someone in Google just says, we're going to ax Waze, like we're only going to go for Maps, and we're going to put a pop-up on ways that's going to say, hey, dude, like you've got maps on your phone, too. You might want to try that one. 
it's pretty bad for those who actually want to stay in Waze, right? So if you're a product manager for Maps and you work for Google, it's pretty important that you understand the product managers that work for Waze pretty much all roll up to the same place. So these are basically everything that we kind of fleshed out. This is something I want to focus on a little bit because we haven't touched this. We talked about promotions, right? What's the problem with promotions? Like I, I wrote it out here, but basically like someone help me flesh this out. What's the issue with promoting all the time? So devaluing the product. So one, you train them, that's great. But then you said something about you attract customers who are what? So yeah, let's spell it out. So these are customers who would only go for the, uh, only take the incentive uh, or the experience, sorry, when you discount it by 50%. Let's take an extreme example, right? So they took it. You've lost money on these customers because I'm going to tell you that 50% off of the experience is pure, co pure cost on your end. You're hoping it's going to increase kind of engagement in the future. You're not going to give it to them again. But they're never, never going to take it up again, right? So that's one. When you talk about apps too, so Spotify, stuff like that, I've probably opened Spotify on five different accounts, right? And I probably paid one month because I probably forgot to unsubscribe. But if they're going to give out, if you're, if you're someone who's like, ah, this is, I like this product, but I'm not a hardcore music listener. I, now and then I want to like open the app and like tell it exactly which artists I want to listen to. And you don't care about all of your like playlists and connections and all that. You only want to listen to music. You're always going to pick up that offer, right? So you got to be able to map these customers. But the idea is when you promote, it's very much correlated to lower engagement. Now, am I saying never promote? No, right? Because promoting also gets you um, to those cheap customers that might not actually be cheap. They're just not sure. So they buy, I don't know, they buy a device for 50 bucks instead of 100. They really like it. They start buying content. They're increasing their engagement. And then they might buy more products at a higher price. But there is one thing I really loved that you said with the training of customers. If you are, if your incentive is predictable, that sucks, right? Because a customer, it's like I just mentioned for Spotify, it's predictable. They're always going to have this like free three months for 99 cents. Like it's, it's and, and it's always, it's not like they do it at the end of the year. It's always there. It's just like, if it's predictable, there's a good chance engagement drops. The promotion cycle for Amazon in general is predictable. You've got Prime Day. So how, if, you, if you work for Amazon, what do you do to flip that, to change that? But you should have a really good justification to say, the amount that I promote to balance it out with the engagement that I'm getting is kind of like what I found, found to be the sweet spot. Right, so potentially, Spotify is saying, yeah, we're going to promote all the time, but that's my sweet spot. Because you're always going to get the customers who don't care. Like, they're going to buy whenever. Not so price conscious. You're always going to get customers with low willingness to pay. So without promotions, you're never going to get them. Right? So there has to be this balance. Once you launch, we're getting close to the end of what are we going to do to actually understand once we launch the feature, once we change the product, what are we going to do to understand are we actually right? Were we right? Basically track ourselves. So you've got to store all their data. You've got to do the acquisition cost. They're going to fall off. You're going to send them an email later to actually come back to the platform. You're going to try to understand why did they drop off. All those things cost. So it's not always the case with software where basically it's like one extra plus one customer is zero. Also, um, you are getting ads, like you are getting revenue for, from, from people or for, for companies who need for Spotify to have this, you know, um, free 
tier, right? So there's all these elements. I don't work at Spotify, but I'm pretty sure they either got their sweet spot with the promotions or they're still trying to figure this out. Like, don't make the assumptions outside that because it's a huge company like Airbnb, like, they've got it down to the science. No, they're experimenting all the time. They may do something and at the end of the year say, oh, that was a bad choice. We should have not provided incentives for experiences because no one's picking the, this up, right? So short answer is maybe, who knows, uh, but something to think about. So let's go back to these. So this is kind of like a simple way of, uh, of, of, of how I like to think about, uh, are we, like, how do we track? Are we doing the right things? So, you know, for Amazon, I'll use Amazon as an example. You got the customer reviews. You launch a product, you watch those reviews like a hawk. So I don't know, for example, experiences. If there was a specific experience on, um, on Airbnb, um, you want to see if people are actually liking the experience. Those who've picked up the offer, right, picked up the incentive, are they giving it five stars versus someone who didn't pick up the incentive and it's giving it four stars, right? If you pay something for less, you might give it more stars because it costs you less. So you want to see, hey, if I'm incentivizing customers, does it increase my customer reviews? That's also a good metric to check. Then you got customer service. That's, I mean, customer service is very good to, to basically um, flag issues, right? You launch something, first day, customer service is calling you back as a product manager, like, we've got this issue, this issue, they don't know how to set this up, they don't know what's going on, the promo isn't working, this marketing thing, they, they, they don't understand, so they're calling us, so you gotta watch customer service because they're gonna give you the non-quantitative uh, data that might take a few days to flow in. Then you got the quantitative data, this is queries. This is like, you gotta set up the measuring. This is like your BI folks, right? This is like the business intelligence folks, this is your Tableau, this is your um, SQL, this is everything that you've laid out to start to track trends post-launch. Then you've got anecdotes. I love this, okay? To me, what this means in practice to me is at 5 p.m. every day, I log on to Reddit, to the Kindle Reddit forum, and I just read, and, which is a, a very good, uh, like, like, there's a ton of people there. I, I, I don't understand what they're doing, but they're, they're always talking about Kindle. I read everything that was written that day. I read all the comments, and you start to understand stuff. I can't tell you how many times I found, I found issues with how this product is being sold in very, like, weird places. Like, they're telling each other, go to Target and, like, Tell the, tell the representative they want to, they give them a coupon code, then they go to the register, they actually just give one, they get a discount on, the, you know, like they find ways to like game you. Um, so that's one. The second thing is they really, they're loyal customers. So they're gonna tell each other what's wrong or what they like about the product. So you're gonna say, hey, like I had an issue with them uh, really not liking a specific uh, uh, next best read. That, uh, that Kindle has suggested, and they shared it with, they didn't call customer service, they just shared it, right, with each other. And so, um, right away, I was like, oh, this, is, this, this could be very, very bad. We gotta reach out to the content team and tell them that Kindle is suggesting this specific book, which is a, not a book you would wanna suggest. And so, these are anecdotes. This is hard to get people, um, like, to, to focus on within the organization because these are very specific small things and they're not these huge data trends. And people like data trends. So you gotta have both because if this is a story, this is interesting. You gotta be able, so if it's one customer that says, ha, this sucks, but you also see in the data that fine, but like 900,000 other customers really love this and it increased the engagement, you put that aside. But if this customer is telling you about something that might break, for other customers, it's flagging something or something that could become really risky or maybe just get you thinking about something. Maybe a customer would say something, I would read it and I'm like, interesting, let me go create a, a whole different query that I didn't even think about and be like, oh, this customer is actually behaving like 50,000 of our customers every month, right? So 
I wouldn't even know how to look for this data without these anecdotes. So you got to kind of break those apart and define that. Competitive reactions is important. You do something, what does your competitor do? Spotify does something, what does Apple Music do, right? If they react, maybe you're onto something. If they react differently, maybe you're off of something, right? So all these things are also important. I'm going to end with um, an example that I wrote nothing about. I just found this pretty fascinating, right? So this was Nordstrom return policy. Um, I don't know when, but at some point in the past. And this is the one I've screenshotted yesterday. So in the past, they say, we don't actually have a return policy for purchases made at Nordstrom stores or Nordstrom.com. Super ambiguous. Like, what does that even mean? Like, as a customer, shopping at Nordstrom, so, so do I, can I return it? Do, like, do I just go there and, I don't know, try to return it? Like, what's up? Now, Nordstrom is known to be a pretty good customer experience company. They're probably going to accept it, right? But they made a change, right? This change didn't come from nothing. Like, all the, like this, is, this is probably, I don't know how many legal folks are on top of something like this, but they made a change as we handle returns on a case-by-case -case basis with the ultimate objective of making our customers happy. It didn't really... Uh, change much for you as a customer because you still don't know if you're going to be able to return this. Um, but all of a sudden, they do have a return policy. It's on a case-by-case -case study, right? Why did they make this change? So I don't really care about what they wrote, but like, why did they make this change? There was obviously some issue. Like, there, there was obviously something going on, right? So my hypothesis is, and it's, I mean, it's pretty common, you're a retailer, you want to reduce the returns, right? Now, that goes head to head with, I want to increase my basket size, right? So as a customer, let's focus just on online. As a customer, they want you to put more and more stuff in your basket before you check out, right? My assumption is, as they increase that, it's correlated with returns. So they got to find some sweet spot, right? So we're product managers right now. Let's assume that they want to reduce their returns, okay? That's our um, kind of like, that's the sentence I'm giving you on your first day of the job. Reduce returns from Nordstrom online. So why do we do this? Why would we do this? Because like, right, we, first, we, we first zoom out and we're like, why? Very internal stuff, right, so far. And it could be that it's only internal. They're like, we're processing all these returns. It's operation. Someone goes to the store, potentially. If not, they got to go to FedEx. There's a huge amount of cost on simply operating this thing. Who is the customer cohort? If you were to break down Nordstrom shopping online to two customer cohorts, I guess, or whatever. Who, who would be the cohort for this specific problem? I would suggest to break down customer cohorts by the, those who are most likely to create this problem for you. So if, if some customer is putting in their bucket, in their bucket, in their, uh, in their uh, cart, 10 Nikes with like, Different sizes, different things, I'm pretty sure they're going to return, right? Like, they are, their action is telling you they're going to return, for sure. So that's one thing. Maybe I'm going to break down my customers for this problem for n amount of items in a cart. Just made this up. But this is something potential that you can think about and unpack as, uh, as a product manager for Nordstrom Online. So... How will you measure this? Let's say, let's say we've decided that anyone who buys uh, more than one item in a, sp in a single category, so like more than one shoe, or more than two dresses, or it falls into the high risk, and anyone else is not, right? So how will you actually measure this? Are we, so once, once you implement something, how would you, what do you care about? How would you measure your success? 
Um, what I would do is really see um, if for the customers that I've identified and took action on, have I changed their behavior? Are they, am, did I now do something that will make the opposite and make them not buy anything? Maybe they go, they're like, all right, I can't buy 10 shoes because something blocks me. Like maybe the solution is like a pop-up that says you can't add more than five shoes. So they're like, oh, I'm gonna go to Nike. I'm gonna get this at Nike, right? So all these things is how would we actually measure? But the idea is less returns over a specific month for a specific cohort, for a specific category, for a specific time of the year, um, for a specific price. Like maybe I only care about measuring the returns for items I've discounted by more than 15%.